My name is Carlos. I'm a robot operator. I started out in sanitation. What I would tell those uh, that are interested in, in working for National Beef, sky's the limit here. People are friendly. If you're a go-getter, you're going to accomplish it. And this is the place to do it. Looking for a job with an opportunity to grow? See Carlos' story and apply now at nationalbeef.com slash careers or call us at 419-257-5535. It's Monday. It's July 17th. And the word of the day is snacksident, which means the inadvertent eating of way too many baby bells or other snack oh, items. Okay. Used in a sentence, there's also a variation of snacksident called gincident. <laughs> and those are both legitimate <laughs> medical terms, Noah, who's laughing. Uh, Heath, sometimes if you have too many gincidents, there's an intervention incident. <laughs> okay. What? There's a... That joke is literally too good to follow up on, Eli. That's you just nailed it. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's far center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Hollywood finds a sag it can root for. We'll learn that anything could be a UFO if you're dumb enough. And Mike Lindell is selling bag of pretty good pillow stuff as is on <laughs> Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> <Logo>. Untested. <laughs> but first... The rest of the intro music. <laughs> New like used. <laughs> Isn't it, though? Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, no illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, happy late Bastille yeah. Day. Yeah. Right? Bonjour. Uh, pro tip, it's easier to get a guillotine rental if you uh, celebrate late, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like getting the Cadbury eggs, right? A little bit yeah, after. Yeah, right. Exactly. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, so everything's on discount now. <laughs> All right. Before we get to the lead story, we have a pre-lead story that is very, very important. Do you remember the name Stu Peters? Ever so slightly, Stuart yes. <laughs> Peters, yeah. He's a conservative news host. Uh, after learning the craft of that as a bounty hunter, he started as a bounty hunter. He made an anti-vaxxer movie that was GAM episode 382. That's probably where you remember his name from. Well, here is a recent tweet from Stu Peters that I saw, and I, I had to mention it. It's got a little bit more about science in, you know, his mind. Quote, the temperature in, scare quotes, space, the temperature in space is minus 457.87 degrees Fahrenheit. Kind of weird that it gets so cold as you get closer to the sun. What? End quote. Oh, oh. <laughs> Money where your mouth is, too. I will supply the rocket and the fuel. All you need to bring is a fucking tank top and a pair of shorts. Apparently. That's right. <laughs> Stu Peters is so stupid at this point that I don't know what he doesn't believe in in that sentence. Right? Is it space? It's, it's tricky, right? Distance? Whoops, is he doubting with Zach Tweet? A tweet. lot to unpack. Yeah. It's the, the genre of people who are like, yeah, outer space is up. That's up. So yeah. if you get and it's it, like, all I love closer that to genre. the sun, and yeah. the- <laughs> <laughs> so which dumb. I mean, it is up. In it some it sense. is technically up, yeah. It's also down, but you just can't go through. It's fine. In our lead story tonight, Mike Lindell is having a really bad week, you guys, Aww. for real, Aww. and it's all thanks to cancel culture. And by that, I mean the part of our culture in which major retail companies cancel their orders for shitty Christian pillows from lunatics who try to overthrow American democracy. That, and also, actually, the kind of standard use of cancel culture. Mike Lindell is horrible, and he had a consequence. Had a consequence, yeah. Yep. With all his pillow deals getting canceled, Lindell had to start auctioning off a whole bunch of equipment from his my pillow company. Yeah. And he's really, really forklifts sad about it. And it's like a forklift and stuff. And yeah. Sh- yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess I guess he can take comfort in the fact that the harder it is for him to get to sleep at night, the easier it's going to be for all the people who might otherwise have purchased a my pillow. So, oh yeah, it's like the opposite of opportunity cost. <laughs> it, like, helped people. Okay, now I want to know what else he's auctioning, right? Because because I had a chance to bid on Milo Yiannopoulos's golden painted chair, and I've always regretted that I did. not Okay, mm-hmm. e- Eli, seriously, in two days, if you and I go up to Minnesota, we can like personally. <laughs> 
get. I bet we could buy a bunch something of his really stuff. precious to him, like the first fifty bucks for the mustache. Play. Right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let us fuck you. <laughs> you didn't say a dollar amount. I know. Coming once. <laughs> coming twice. This handful of crack. <laughs> um, I love okay. handfuls of crack. <laughs> you strike a hard market. <laughs> so, so apparently things were going great for the MyPillow company and they expanded out their production around 2019. But then Joe Biden won the election of 2020. Allegedly. Asterisk. Yeah. And <laughs> Lindell, yeah, you step ahead of me. He did a pretty big pivot at that point and started focusing on his docu journalism and cyber forensics mm -hmm. careers <laughs> instead of the pillows. That went very badly. He tried to spread lies about the election. He did approximately $1.3 billion worth of defamation mm -hmm. just to one company, possibly more to others. Mm -hmm. He farted on camera famously. With a voice he, modulator. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he did. Well, yeah, he tried to gaslight the audience of the movie about the gas using that mm -hmm. modulator. Mm -hmm. Then more lying, more lying, more lying. And now it looks like he lost all his business from MyPillow. That includes cancellations by Kohl's, Bed Bath & Beyond, Wayfair, Costco, and Walmart. According to Lindell, quote, we lost $100 million from attacks by the box stores, the shopping networks, and the shopping channels. These were attacks mm -hmm. of not buying. Mm -hmm. How does, how does this continue. quote end? Is it the greatest yeah. fucking nine uh, words in the history of... Wait, is yes, it is. Great question. Words? And yes, yeah. it is. He <laughs> continues. This is the end of that quote. Exactly. All of them did... Cancel culture on us. And <laughs> it was did on them. Yes, it was him, yeah. did upon them. I just, I want this story at the tip of everybody's mind when, when people warn about how like companies might make suboptimal market choices under socialism. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But for my part, I think it's journalistically very important that we know exactly when those stores were still carrying treason guys pillows. Yeah. Like I want to know where all their lines were. It's important to me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's too recent. Too it's recent. too recent. Yeah. But in terms of, you know, socialism, the invisible hand of the market, the invisible hand is punching Mike Lindell in the dick yes, right now, yes, which is fun. Absolutely. And he's like, cancel culture. <laughs> so uh, one other amazing detail here. During an interview with the Daily Beast, oh, Lindell on, suggested <laughs> he suggested that Bed Bath & Beyond went bankrupt because they stopped selling his pillows. Really? That, of course, sounded insane. So the follow up question was, uh you want to try that again? Are you saying literally that lack of my pillow in the store made them go bankrupt? And Lindell responded, quote, no, 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 no. But if you look at the history, you can draw your own conclusion. Was it in part because they didn't sell my pillow? You know, I guess use your own thing, end quote. And I think he was... He was looking for brain when he said thing. <laughs> Use your own brain is what he couldn't come up with. Uh, damn it, though. Word for it's right on the tip of my thing. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I, at a certain point, his dementia is going to cross the Rubicon into no longer funny for us. But we're still on this side, and I'm yes, loving it. Yes, yes. I, well, I, <laughs> I don't see that other side happening of the Rubicon or whatever. No, it's all the fun side. I don't care. So later in that same interview, the topic of Mike Lindell getting sued for billions of dollars came up, naturally. That includes the $1.3 billion lawsuit from Dominion Voting, and of course, the $5 million that Lindell was ordered to pay after he lost a $5 million challenge that he issued against himself with no upside yep. for himself, yeah. and he lost. Lindell claimed that his packet data absolutely proved that Joe Biden lost that election and he'd give $5 million to anyone who could disprove his absolute proof. And some guy showed that Lindell just had a random spreadsheet with numbers that were definitely not packet data of any kind and were therefore completely unrelated to the 2020 election. It wasn't even data. It had informational content of zero. Yep. Well, here's the response from Lindell regarding all those lawsuits against him and judgments against him. Quote, have you ever seen the movie My Cousin Vinny? Oh, no, come on, Mike. 
Remember at the end Come on. when the cop said, I took it upon myself to say he found the gun and all this stuff? Sick. And then in, in light of the new evidence, case dismissed. I mean, this is what you're going to see when all this comes to light with the evidence I have. And <laughs> exact, exact quote. quote that started with, you ever seen yeah, my Yeah, right, 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 because he needed an example to hash out the complicated concept of <laughs> acquittal. Hey, Mike. Yep. Hey, Mike, you, you willing to put $5 million on that? <laughs> oh, my yeah. great evidence you got. Honestly, based on his description, I'm willing to bet $5 million that Mike Lindell hasn't seen my cousin Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. And one other detail. Lindell announced that my pillow is going to be shifting their business model from the brick and mortar retailers to direct sales. And they're going to be marketing the brand through podcasts mm -hmm. now. That includes an offer to buy some ads on our sister show, Citation Needed. Yes. Please let us no. do it. I, we, we, I, we said no because of fucking morality, blah, 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 I something like so that. Much. Some bullshit, I think. <laughs> but here's the thing. There is a number, and that morality goes away for the other guys, too. I'm pretty sure, right? Everybody's got a number. <laughs> and keep in mind, Mike Lindell, we might start advertising your stuff Either way, uh -huh. and you will not enjoy the copy if we do it without any of your input. What I'm saying is bring a really big bag of money and pillow stuff to the drop point, and we won't do ads for my <laughs> pillow that we decide upon. <laughs> so, I want the mustache on a forklift. Okay. <laughs> We're sending you a photo of what we did to liquid death, and you have 24 <laughs> hours. There's a modulator involved again. Yeah, nice. exactly. Sparkle donkey. The tequila for fucking your Christian pillow. <laughs> <laughs> and in Bob Hates Sags news. I'll admit, I don't particularly listen to or watch a lot of true crime stuff. However, my wife does. And that's why I'm aware of many of its tropes. One such trope, if you've overheard enough murder podcasts, is the deadly one last chance. A couple, who clearly are about to murder each other, break up. Our story seems to be ending. And then, one of them asks for one last chance. Moments later, there's a poker missing from the fireplace and the police are discussing splatter patterns. And the relationship between Bob Iger and Disney seems no different, as moments after rejoining the ranks of the Mouse House and other various production studios, negotiations were handled so badly that both the Writers Guild and now the Screen Actors Guild have gone on strike. Yeah, Bob, dude, when it comes to forcing people to come face to face with the exploitative nature of the employee-employer dynamic and inspiring them to face it head on, you're like... Two spaces below World War One at this point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he really is. So, also, you're in a very deep analogy that Eli just made. With the <laughs> murder podcast podcasts. about murder. <laughs> Trust me, they're, they're the true crime fans get it. So, little background here. It's been a tough couple of years for movie studios and TV networks. Uh, just a half a decade too late, they notice that fewer people are watching cable TV and going to the movies. More prefer to stay at home and stream because... Perhaps cinema is not best enjoyed between an old couple narrating the movie to each other at full volume and a young couple desperately getting to 22nd base mere inches from your popcorn bucket. Damn it, isn't it enough that theaters added reclining seats a mere six decades after their commercial introduction, Eli? Is that not <laughs> enough for you? Yeah. Also, popcorn isn't good. I don't understand. Like, <laughs> why is that still the only fucking food that you have there? Right. So weird. Or wait, yeah. or like you can give me some nachos and steaming cheese to take into the theater with me. Fuck you. Do you want to dip a Tostito into lava? That'll be 75 minutes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the solution these movie and TV companies landed on for this problem was to launch their own streaming services. All of them. Because the problem people had with TV channels was not getting to pay for them individually, apparently. And they have lost hundreds of millions of dollars in these pursuits. Well, they've decided it's time to pay. And the people who should do that paying are the crate stacking bartenders on SVU and the bleary eyed authors of their words. Yes. And the people yeah. who like Turner Classic movies. Right, exactly. <laughs> And if you go by the headlines I've been seeing, the biggest victim is you, the oppressed consumer who can't watch 
fucking Love Island 19 for a bit longer. <laughs> yes. Seriously, the first sentence of the article about this in the New York Times that Eli used here is, quote, here's why Hollywood is facing its first industry-wide shutdown in more than 60 years and what it could mean for your favorite shows. <laughs> Jesus. So when the Writers Guild of America and this past week the Screen Actors Guild approached the, uh, the studios for a paltry raise and less than 3% of profit share during this last round of planned negotiations, the studio's answers, at best, was just no. And... If you're wondering where Bob Iger comes into this, well, if the studios have acted like shadowy big business tycoons up to no good, Bob Iger has been their joker, releasing a barely <laughs> anonymous threat through deadline to extend the strike until people lose their homes, and openly telling the press that the two unions' demands were, quote, unrealistic. Yeah, two helpings of gruel? Come on! I'm going to give yeah. everybody to. Okay. In response to this, did you see the thing Ron Perlman posted? Yeah. It's fucking am <laughs> It's terrifying. Comrade Ron Perlman Ron. is going to murder Bob <laughs> Iger with his hands. He posted a short video called like, I'm going to murder Schmob Schmiger with my hands. But it's like <laughs> so dark and serious. It's like, oh, lose houses? There's a lot of ways to lose houses. Anybody could lose a house. I don't know. I'm just thinking of somebody random, not Schmob Schmeiger. I don't know why I said that. House fire is one. That's one way to lose a house. Okay, bye. I love Ron Perlman because, and this is fine, every tough guy in Hollywood is just an actor. And hey, that's totally cool. Like nothing good. But for some reason, Ron Perlman <laughs> slipped through the cracks and he's a movie tough guy who is also just ready to assault and batter at all times. <laughs> right. Oh, he's not just an actor of that. That's real for sure. You know who Ron Pearl? I, I think of Ron Perlman as your dad. Mm -hmm. he, he, I never met your dad, but they feel similar, similar based on what dudes, I know. Yep. Yeah. Very, very ready to assault. Yeah. Um, right. So now <laughs> the writers and actors are on strike and Bob Iger and apparently even less reasonable groups of anonymous studio heads are waiting to see reason. But speaking of unrealistic, there's two details of this story that are just too insane not to share. The first one, which I just learned about the morning of this recording, is that uh, because all the actors are on strike, the red carpet of Haunted Mansion was occupied by costumed characters like Mickey and Minnie and the nice. Wicked Queen from Rough. the corresponding Disney World. But my favorite, my favorite detail. <laughs> There's just a laptop with like Bing's chatbot and you can talk to Literally, it. Literally, yes. red carpet and that's it. Well, speaking of which, my favorite <laughs> part of this battle has been the battle over AI. So the Writers Guild has been explicit in their demands that studios promise not to use AI to generate scripts, which... I understand, right? However, it was the studio's counteroffer to the Actors Guild that was the most bizarre. The studio's opening bid was that they would like to be able to scan extras' faces and bodies, pay them for one day's work, and then use those AI-generated version of their faces and bodies in all movies in perpetuity without any compensation whatsoever for all time, yes. forever. <laughs> forever. Ursula from The Little Mermaid is like, that's a bit much, isn't it? I don't <laughs> okay, what about something less evil? I feel like you need you need me to negotiate with you a little bit. We'll do less evil. I'm going to slide a basket with lotion across the table. <laughs> How about something with skin masks? Is this cool? Right. So I imagine this strike will go on for a while. Uh, there's a lot of ground between can we have enough money to live and I want your unpaid compu clone to dance for me for eternity. <laughs> uh, but I do think the writers and actors will come out on top, um, mostly because, you know, there was art before movie studios. Good art. Great, great art, even. And, um, you know, if they don't watch their P's and Q's. There will be art after Ron Perlin murders all of them. Yeah. So, you know, that's what I'm saying is you, Ron Perlman's watching. We can yeah. only hold him back for so long. <laughs> and in harmed services news, through all the growing polarization in American politics over the last couple of decades, there have been a few things that American lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have consistently agreed on. Like, for example, the fact that we need to spend more on our military than the next 10 biggest militaries combined. Obviously. Not our fault that we need 33 times as much security as Canadians. That's just the way it shook out. 
But that traditional bipartisan commitment to national defense slash fear of looking like you don't support the troops showed a few cracks on Friday when the Republican-controlled Congress rammed through a doomed version of the National Defense Authorization Act with a fuck ton of culture war non-starters, like policies that would restrict military personnel's access to reproductive care, dial back military support for trans troops and their families, and reduce the military's commitment to diversity. Guys, it fucks up the imperialism if we look like the victims too much. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's it's about logistics, not hate. Yes. We're not doing this for hate. We just need to white it up a little bit for, like, uniform stuff. So the $886 billion bill passed the House by a margin of 219 to 210, uh, that 219 did include four Democrats from swing districts with heavy military presence, as well as all but four of the Republicans that voted. Uh, the poison pills that held the rest of the Democratic Party at bay included an end to policies that support service members that have to travel out of state for abortions, prohibitions on specialized health care for transgender troops or members of their family, and defunding programs for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because the bigots in the GOP don't even balk at just saying the problem is that you're letting black people in anymore. Yeah, actually, that's weird. The same phrase happened in a ruling against Harvard a couple weeks ago from the Supreme Court. <laughs> also, quick reminder for those frustrated that we only held the Senate in the last election. If we hadn't, this bat shittery would be on its way to becoming law right well, now. Yeah, I mean, Biden wouldn't sign it, but yes. Um, right. Now, I, I should note, by the way, that because the Republican majority in the House is so narrow, what threat there was to the passage of this bill mostly came from the right and not, as I'm sure you've already predicted, from the reasonable wing of the party that didn't want to inject culture war bullshit into, like, military readiness. Instead, it came from the Putin stooge contingent... That includes Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates, who objected to the bill because it continued to provide funding for Ukraine. And the only way McCarthy won their votes was by promising vague concessions and future amendments to military spending. Okay, fine. Marjorie, you can personally shoot a Jew laser out of the sky with a bazooka. Now sign your <laughs> fucking vote, okay? <laughs> And uh, Matt, you can have something that you want. Don't say it out loud. Don't yeah, say it out. Right. We'll, just, we'll figure it out. Shut <laughs> we'll up. Figure it We'd out. have to bleep it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, Republicans are selling this with a time-tested political strategy known inside the Beltway as, no, you are. In their telling of the story, it's the Democrats trying to bring their woke agenda into the military with all this diversity and trans-inclusive stuff, and they're just trying to focus on military readiness. Uh, as House Speaker Kevin McCarthy summarized it after the doom to bill passed, quote, just focus on the military. Stop using taxpayer money for wokeism, end quote. Okay. Yeah, so there are two problems with this argument. Well, sorry, two categories of problems with this argument. Broad categories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first is that according to the military, a commitment to diversity is a key component to military readiness since it allows the military to draw from the largest possible pool of candidates. Right? Like, I mean, keep in mind that the military's pitch to high caliber talent is it's like the private sector job you could do except you get paid less and possibly shot at. Right. That's that's like being a teacher. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Hard sell. Hard sell to begin with. And that isn't made any easier when you have to say, also, we're adopting the HR policies of an Amish Hobby Lobby. (laughs) Okay. that said, I do want to hear from the person who's not joining the military because it's not woke enough. Like, what's that guy's moral (laughs) compass? What's going on there? Well, not to shit on your jokey like, but that guy is trans. Uh, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So but but the second problem with McCarthy's wokeism defense, though, is that if they're right and the problem really is the rampant woke agenda hurting our military readiness, then they were woke up until last Thursday. It's a very good point. <laughs> yeah. Right. Even when they controlled the White House and both houses of Congress in 2017, they passed the NDAA complete with all these woke provisions that they're suddenly outraged about with a vote of 344 to 81 in the House and 89 to 8 in the Senate. Huh. So weird. Also, just for the record, the Republican senators from places like Wyoming, Alaska, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, those are affirmative action hires. Thank you. We give those places a two senator quota. And I think it's time for that to end. And I think all the Republicans would agree. Would they not? Yeah, at the very least, it's legacy admissions. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah. The, the good news is that this is obviously going to die in the Senate, as Eli already alluded to. And even if it somehow did, there's no fucking way that Biden would sign it. The bad news is that there's no real clear path to reconciliation from there. 
Republicans don't have the votes to pass a clean version of this bill without Democratic support, and McCarthy is too much of a coward to bring something to the floor that would need to count on Democratic support. Oh, what's that, Republicans? Are you now the dysfunctional body America will blame and not us? Lick my walls, Republicans, for they are made of stone. <laughs> and this is going to come back to bite us. Yeah, yes. right, right. Now, but oh, no, I, not politics. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I also I want to address a dumb response that you're going to hear about this from the left, which is that this is somehow good because we spent too much money on the military already. Yes, of course we do. Our military budget is a national embarrassment. But the way you bring down military spending isn't by torpedoing the NDAA. It's by changing programs, right? What, what this does is fuck with the military personnel's pay raises and vendor payments and shit. Right. Like, I guess there's probably somebody out there that's like, you know, fuck the guy who provides produce to Fort Benning. But I feel like most of us are taking entirely <laughs> different issues with military spending. Yep. And in quack into the left news, <laughs> so Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is hanging out near grassy knolls all the time. <laughs> and yet here he is still with us alive. Barely, but yes, alive. That's just a true sentence. I'm not adding any like judgments or suggestions mm -hmm. to that. Yep. I just said a true thing. Yep. Ron and Perlman. Despite you're being one of the most <laughs> dangerous liars in the country, spreading every possible conspiracy theory he ever heard, he's also somehow the top Democratic candidate for next year's presidential election other than Joe Biden. Well, RFK Jr. made a strong bid to become a top Republican candidate at the same time last week. He's actually being talked about as a running mate for Trump, I heard in a couple Jesus articles. Christ. Yeah. Well, he did that when he headlined a climate change denier gala in New York City, during which he suggested that COVID was part of a literal race war against white people. And okay, black people too, though, according right. to his thing. So so it's woke, I get. I know it was very confusing, but he did say oh, all that stuff. That's how you get Republicans to finally line up against COVID. Tell them it's woke. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. So now, <laughs> there are three important caveats that I want to add to that second to Biden in the polls thing, because I've seen a lot of people actually fretting over this one. Biden's, it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> right. Biden's leading by 57 fucking points. Second, at least half of the 17% that he's getting are people responding to him sharing a name and a lineage with the most beloved president in the party's history. Um, third, or maybe second most beloved, but third, for better or worse, Americans are too ableist to elect a guy who talks like that. I'm sorry. That's just the okay, way it but is. That's true. But We're probably safe on that. But think of the skits we could do on the show, no. guys. <laughs> no. It's like Melania voice times a thousand. I've been practicing. Well, he's way more evil. He deserves it more than Melania probably. Yeah. Exactly. For the sketches. Is Thank it worth? I don't know. Maybe we should start campaigning for the sketches. I'm voting for him no matter what. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Great. All right, let's start with uh, the race war. Sure. So, uh, sorry, no, weird phrasing. I heard it. As soon as I said it, I heard it. Let's talk about how RFK Jr. suggested there was a race war component to the COVID pandemic. That's what I was saying, Here's yeah, he, to Heath. Yep, that, that okay. Also. <laughs> Here's what he had to say during the event. Quote, COVID-19, there's an argument that it's ethnically targeted. COVID-19 attacks certain races disproportionately. COVID-19 is targeted to attack Caucasians and black people. What? The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews oh. and Chinese. Oh. End quote. Oh. Chinese. Seriously? Oh. Quote, yeah, Chinese is exact. It's <laughs> rough. Uh, so he said that. He really did say that. And that's when someone followed up with, fucking what? Yeah. And Kennedy had to clarify. He added... Again, quote, we don't know whether it was deliberately targeted or not, weather. but there are papers out there that show the racial or ethnic differential and impact. We do know that the Chinese are spending hundreds of millions of dollars developing ethnic bioweapons and we are developing ethnic bioweapons. I guess he meant the U.S. too. They're collecting Russian DNA. They're collecting Chinese DNA so we can target people by race, end quote. Fucking, well, they're coming for your whiteness. <laughs> Jeez, I'm, he's, I'm, just, I'm just asking questions uh, here. You know, I'm not, they, I'm asking questions that implicate the Jews in an effort to poison the air with a disease that targets <laughs> the whites. But I'm just asking Also questions. the Chinese is to be clear. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which we got to admit is pretty ironic because 
unlike with African Americans who were unduly affected by COVID because of income inequality, white people were unduly affected by COVID because of idiots like RFK it's, Jr. It's yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Thank you, Eli. He might as well be a <laughs> bat flying out of a laboratory window at this point. <laughs> like, okay, no, sorry, Eli. Do you think the lab leak hypothesis is that a, a COVID infected bat flew out a window? Is that what you're saying? No. I feel like that's he told, what he's he saying, told right? That's what, he, that's, I, what that's, that's what he was saying. Okay. So in response to the video <laughs> of Kennedy at the event in New York, the Anti-Defamation League and several other sane groups of people came out with official statements condemning the remarks, which very clearly provide fuel for xenophobic and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And it's hard to give Kennedy the benefit of the doubt given his history. So, okay, he has a bunch of good history, too. He's like an environmental lawyer. He has a bunch of good opinions, but he sucks on all this stuff. And he's got all these conspiracies going now, and he sucks on anti-Semitism real bad. He met with Nation of Islam leadership in 2020 and told them the COVID vaccine was, quote, genetically modified to attack black and Latino boys. And then in 2022, he suggested that Anne Frank had more freedom than people living under vaccine mandates right now in the United States. All that being said, Kennedy now says the video of himself talking was mistaken. And he tweeted, I do not believe and never implied that the ethnic effect was deliberately engineered. End quote. You implied. Like, first first of all, that's bullshit. But secondly, even if it wasn't, you brought it up and then didn't imply you didn't believe it. Yeah. Right? At best. <laughs> right. Also, and you absolutely implied well, it. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Also, is your claim now that it was an accident? Like, oh, fuck. That bat that escaped out the window? That's the one we showed nothing but Fiddler on the Roof to. He's not going to get any of the Jews. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just going to read a sentence of his one more time. <laughs> COVID-19 is targeted to attack Caucasians and black people. It, I, I think it could be it. a coincidence. So <laughs> it's hard for that not to imply anything about itself. Mm -hmm. Anyway, moving on. Uh, was there a giant fart is probably your next question. <laughs> yes. And it was the headliner of the goddamn yes, event. Yes, it was. At some point during a Q&A segment of this event, Kennedy got a question about the environment. And before he could even answer... A former gossip columnist, current drunk old white guy, and the host of the whole event named Doug Desher stood up and yelled, the climate hoax, in response to somebody saying the word climate. He had to scream that. That's when a different drunk old white guy, a much better one, named Anthony Hayden Guest of the Daily Beast, stood up and yelled, shut the fuck up. And for the next several minutes... This guy, Doug, who sucks, yelled climate denier talking points, while this guy, Anthony, who's pretty cool, yelled an extended roast of Doug in a delightful drunk <laughs> British accent. <laughs> and here's what happened next. And this is according to journalist Mara Siegler of Page Six, who was watching this all happen. Quote, here, it seems, Doug Desher sensed the need for a new rhetorical tack and let rip a loud, prolonged fart while yelling, as if to underscore his point, I'm farting now, end quote. <laughs> so, first of all, listeners, I would love like a, a split screen video montage of Heath and I both waking up the day after this happened, seeing the news alert and racing to the computer to create the skeptic rat doc to claim Action this music fucking in the story. Background. Yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it was this and the Lindell the story too. Uh, yeah, it was right, a big week. right, exactly, exactly. But secondly, Heath, fucking malpractice dude how dare you save this fart fact for the end of the story we could have been making fart jokes for three <laughs> paragraphs already that's Correct. fair but that's the it's the headliner you gotta yeah. let them have their openers <laughs> right <laughs> Who, whoever said there will be no laughter in hell was not in my office the first time i read that paragraph <laughs> <laughs> also by the way as that was all happening rfk jr just sat there at the front of the room in silence, <laughs> thinking about his life. Page six got a picture of it. I put oh. it up here in the notes for you. 
listener, it's great. Heath has inserted this photo, and RFK Jr. is just praying for a book depository window with a view right now. He is crazy <laughs> for it. Well, see, now, to me, it looks like, you know, he's like going, he's like, you know, of all the embarrassing stories that were likely to come out of this event, I had this at sixth worst, so this isn't all that bad, you know? <laughs> And in just plain wrong news, not so many years ago, as I visited my wife's hometown for the first time, I photographed with glee a sign at her local hippy-dippy coffee shop that offered raw milk with your coffee and sent it along to Noah and Heath. Plain wrong, raw Thank and you. wrong. Thank you. Yep, yeah. there it is. But Found it. like all terrible things that were funny seven years ago, Raw Milk is back with a vengeance, as this week Iowa became one of more than two dozen states that have legalized the sale of raw milk because it's still poison even if it's extra creamy didn't catch on in quite the way we wish it would have. Oh, jeez. Yeah, just to be clear, the problem they're tackling with this legislation is the fact that Americans' food options aren't unhealthy enough. Okay, so General Order Number 11, it was issued by Major General at the time Ulysses S. Grant of the Union Army in 1862, and it expelled all the Jewish people from his military district, covering parts of Tennessee, Mississippi, and Kentucky. He thought the order would reduce corruption within the Union forces, especially the illicit trade of Southern cotton, which Grant was pretty sure was being run, quote, mostly by Jews and other unprincipled traders. Um, that all happened after pasteurization was invented. I just wanted to give some <laughs> temporal context to where we've rolled the clock back to. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, so I learned of this development from an article in the New York Times titled, Raw Milk is Being Legalized in More States. Is it safe? No, no, it's not, New York Times. No. <laughs> You could just have that be the headline, and it's not safe. Yeah. Yeah. Weird choice to bury the lead. But, you know, I suppose after you've sided with Uri Geller, liquid-borne pathogens is a step up. So, you know, I get it. Sure, yeah. But my favorite quote of this article comes from Dr. Nicole Helen Martin, a dairy microbiologist at Cornell University, who said, quote, We're seeing this a lot post-pandemic. People are turning to local or natural, I'm using air quotes, foods. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome she's like she's asking the journalist is there like a particular font for clapping at you like nancy pelosi clapped at uh, donald trump no okay then i'll settle for the air quotes aside then i guess <laughs> and when asked about the claims that pasteurization destroys vitamins in food martin continued quote the claim that these components are destroyed by pasteurization is simply untrue end quote not adding no air quotes that time. I hate you all so much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know how you don't eat raw chicken? So, yeah. What if I told you there was more vitamin D in the raw chicken? Are you eating it now? No? <laughs> what the fuck am I doing here? Idiots. Now, I should point out, in the name of fairness, many who defend raw milk sale say that the filtration process or glass bottles do the work of pasteurization. But Dr. Yvonne Maldonado, a professor of pediatrics, infectious diseases, and epidemiology at Stanford Medicine, had a colorful metaphor in reply, quote, it's kind of like if you don't wash your hands and you just lick them. <laughs> 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 And also, look, if you're worried about vitamins, take fucking vitamins. That's yeah. stupid. You shouldn't, right? Unless your doctor tells you otherwise. But you could just take fucking, you could wash them down with your normal pathogen-free milk. There you go. I guarantee there are no vitamins that only literally exist in milk. <laughs> There's no way that's true. Yeah. So yeah, to be clear, even the New York Times couldn't find a reason for raw milk that they didn't legally have to contradict in the next sentence of their article with an expert. There's literally no reason under any circumstance to drink dirty milk and think that it's better than clean milk, which in my opinion is a much more appropriate description of pasteurized or not pasteurized. But that won't stop <laughs> Americans because if anything, it'll encourage us. Or, okay, one other strategy, just don't drink milk. It's weird. It's yeah. weird. We're adults. What are you doing? Right. Do you, 
dip a cookie in it, you know, but yeah. Dip it in scotch, whatever. <laughs> and finally tonight, in It Was a Saucer I Saw, Sir News. <laughs> it turns out that to be a stupid addition to the National Defense Authorization Act, you don't have to be conservative or bigoted. You just have to be irrational. And that's the case with a bunch of silly-ass UFO shit that the Senate is cramming into their version of the military funding bill, thanks to the bipartisan efforts of Democratic leader and Amy Schumer's first cousin, Chuck Schumer, and and South Dakota (laughs) Republican Mike Rounds. Uh, The proposed amendment would create a streamlined process for releasing UFO data to the public because, in the estimation of our esteemed Senate, Americans don't spend enough time staring at videos of well-lit bugs close to military cameras and wondering what kind of advanced alien technology (laughs) could craft something so nimble okay if you really think that super advanced aliens are flying their ships next to our military cameras doing aerial stunt shows that defy physics for our entertainment then the only thing you want to see in our legislation is hey if y'all are reading this out there please be nice to us we have like pretty good cookies and scotch and stuff so (laughs) tip one and the other check us out so, so first, let me clarify my outdated nomenclature here. They are no longer UFOs, right? Because that's been deemed too silly to say with a straight face at the highest level of national governance. So now they talk about UAPs, which is a vague pedant's delight of an acronym. It means unidentified <laughs> anomalous phenomena. Uh, because I guess nobody knew which letter eh, started with, right? <laughs> But yeah, the the proposal would require normally classified documents be made public after 25 years without reauthorization. It's a model they borrowed from the current law about records pertaining to the Kennedy assassination, if you're curious how seriously we should take this. Yeah, and also, that was nothing. That's nothing. If the government wants to keep any secrets, they just re-up on classifying the stuff after 25 Pretty years. Much, yeah. I don't understand yeah. how that matters. I, I like it because it means that all the alien footage we're going to get, like all the aliens will have bleach blonde hair and they'll be bopping along to the Beastie Boys. Yeah, it's going right, to be a nice right. throwback no, exactly, for us. Exactly. It'll be nostalgic. <laughs> and look, mostly this kind of shit doesn't matter. I'm all for greater government transparency and this is one way to get at least some of it. But when the end result is releasing more classified material, I feel like the bar should be higher than but the dumbest 7% of our country really, really wants to see it, right? (laughs) And I also think that there's a danger of lending conspiracy theories credibility by taking this kind of shit seriously at such a high level. I mean, look, we've already gotten to the point where actual fucking senators think we need to treat video has nearby well-lit bug in it differently because they might be space aliens. (laughs) And I'm terrified to see what more legitimacy than that even looks like. Have we just like shown, has some pretty good science person who knows some, you know, computer graphics shown that like, yeah, that's a bug. Look, yes. this bug moves like this. Constantly. There you go. And then it's they that. just find a new video. That's yeah, the crazy right. they thing. Move on. They never say, well, I guess the, since the first 13,000 of them that we've explained have all been mundane shit, I guess the 13,000 and first probably is mundane shit too. No, they never get there. Okay, but what are the odds it's going to be a mundane thing again, Noah? That's like, <laughs> it's like eight reds in a row on roulette. What am I, betting red? Yeah. No. You got to check all the drawers for unicorns. Otherwise, you didn't really investigate. <laughs> all right. On that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on uh, threads, and sent us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening. And please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like J.S., Stephen, Cassandra Hall, Nathan Miller, Karen Britton, Jake Lundwall, Jamila Lane, Sam Ritter, Denny Burnsmeyer, DeHock, Silent Dis, Stephen Hubbard, Rob Langston, William King, Par Dahlstrom, Grumpy Ball of Sunshine, Jen Snively, and too much musing new age turmoil, whose beautiful dicks and vaginas were genetically engineered to satisfy all the races and religions of all the <laughs> rankings that apparently exist in RFK Jr.'s head. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, 
DD minus, and citation needed, available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Hey, Eli, would you like to tell, um, while we're still recording, would you like to tell Heath why it is that you've requested we record a little bit early today? Okay, so podcast listener, just to fill you in, uh, which Noah did partially, Heath likes our schedule to stay consistent. He's a, I don't think you would mind Everybody saying, likes that. He, Everybody exactly. has schedules. All people like that. That's just a <laughs> like standard what people thing. who have schedules are going to assume. So the other night I was like, hey, guys, can we record a little earlier in the day? I've got something with my sister and I got to go. thing." And Heath was like, what do you have? And I was like, meh, 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 meh. And then last night I was actually talking to Heath again. He was like, yeah, what do you have tomorrow that we changed our entire recording day for? And I was like, meh, 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 meh. And it was because I Eli said hats. I, it was really weird. It's because yeah. I knew. If I said this, Heath would refuse on moral principle because she has purchased us tickets for the Friends experience. Wait. <laughs> You're talking about the thing? where The, the one with the Friends mm-hmm. where you go to like a thing that looks like their apartment yep. that's impossible and, and in you, New York City? Yeah, and you get the to like 8,000 square foot apartment mm-hmm. for two twenty something yep, people? And our entry time is at 1 o'clock, so uh, that's why our record was early Okay, <laughs> okay. Here's the... I, you have misjudged me, my friend. Ooh. I am. I am a stan for friends. I'm So, to be clear, I'm very much aware, having watched a few since back in the 90s when I learned about the show. I loved it then, and I was like, ha, ah, this is so super funny. Chandler, how funny is he? Wacky. But yes, very, very problematic. Yeah, it doesn't really now. hold up very well. Yeah, it does not hold up no. at all. But I just nostalgically, Friends and Seinfeld next to each other. That was my thing Thursday nights for a while. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Friends. There we go. Yeah. Well, th- see? I would have gone to this with you if I was in town, to be honest. I would have, like, I would have unironically in like a polo shirt tucked into my, my chinos. Like, I would have gone to this happily, like Pat Oswalt going to the Spam Museum, like for real. Phenomenal. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved. My name is Carlos. I'm a robot operator. I started out in sanitation. What I would tell those uh, that are interested in in working for National Beef, sky's the limit here. People are friendly. If you're a go-getter, you're going to accomplish it. And this is the place to do it. Looking for a job with an opportunity to grow? See Carlos Story and apply now at nationalbeef.com slash careers or call us at 419-257-5535.